So you open Google Chrome on your phone. You're rushing to buy tickets to a concert that all your friends are going to. Picture yourself now. Crowd surfing to the front, being invited onto the stage, backstage the world tour, and before you know it, you're dancing in Tokyo. Wait, what? Three tickets left? It's a good thing your saved payment details autofill quickly and securely. There's no place like Chrome. Download Google Chrome on your phone. You're listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where usually each week I talk to an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I've already done that with today's guest. She's the <laughs> first ever guest on this show, and we are doing a bonus episode, which I've done a few of these now, to talk book recommendations. And without exaggeration, this is my favorite person to do book recommendations. <laughs> and actually, probably the, I think the person I've done the most often with in my entire career it's Mallory O'Meara. Mallory, welcome back. How are you doing? I am so good. Honestly, I think if something ever happened and we needed to do a podcast together, that is just me and you, we could just do a book recommendation show every week. No problems. Yeah, it would. Listen, everyone, I I tried to come up with a creative angle for this podcast when I launched it. Like you guys on Reading Glasses have such a unique take, but it really could just be all right, listen, it's Mallory and Adam and we're going to do book. Like you could just have no like hook or fun name. Be like, nope, it's just nothing but book recs. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I should have the intro I should have done is my strongest author friend, but I omitted that part. Why, thank you. <laughs> people who don't know what I'm talking about who are recent listeners to the show, go back to the first ever episode and you can hear Mallory talk about powerlifting. Which is just the which is really just so I can lift up more books. So Right. Yeah, it's like it's always <laughs> important. So Mallory and I are going to do, like we said, a real fastball straight down the middle. We're going to do book recommendations back and forth. But we, before we do that, Mallory has something very important she needs to talk about. When you guys are listening to this, it's going to be the week before her latest book comes out. Tell everybody oh, about your new book. Oh, my God. It's my first book for kids. I'm so nervous. Uh, it is called Girls Make Movies, a follow your own path guide to filmmaking. Uh, so it is what I think the very first filmmaking book's that is directed at young girls. And I created it with my friend, illustrator Jen Vaughn. So it is filled with so many cool illustrations. It looks amazing. And the book teaches you how to make a movie from development all the way to the red carpet. And you make your choices. The pick, the follow your own path part is you get to make your own choices through the book. You want it, you're making a fictional zombie movie. And do you want your zombies to be CGI or do you want them to be practical? And you flip to one page for one and another page for another. And along the way, you find out how movies are made, what sort of jobs are involved and what those people do, how they got their jobs, the tools they use, the things they love about making movies. And because it's me and I'm a historian, uh, it's filled with all kinds of cool women's history, but it's an absolute blast. And it's aimed we try to aim it pretty wide so anywhere from 10 to you know 16 17 can get something out of it so if you have a young person in your life who loves movies who loves making tiktok videos who loves social media who loves creativity this is the book for them really really excited about it and it's yeah, it's coming out next week can't believe it it's uh i listen i'm not just saying this because you're my buddy and you're on the show i already have pre-ordered multiple copies because i have multiple oh, thank have, like, you yeah. Oh, as a 100%. I was actually, I was in, we were talking before we started recording, I was in Universal Studios uh, last weekend and like I was walking around all of their like park stuff that's like all of movie making things and I was sitting, and then I, of course, I saw a creature from the Black Lagoon shirt. I actually can't believe I didn't say Hell it. yeah. But like, I thought I was thinking about this and I knew you were coming on and I was just like, I, it's such a cool idea. It's so unique. Like, how did you... I can't not, I see, I can't not interview people. How did, you, <laughs> before we get to our book recommendations, it's really quickly like, how did you decide, like, I want to make this a choose your own adventure type story? Because you could have just done, like, how to make a movie because that, that is a past life you had. So how did you do that? How did this come to be? 
Oh my God, this book went through so many iterations. It was funny. Uh, when it originally, its original form, I actually wanted to aim it towards adult readers because there's so many people who love movies and just have no idea what a producer does or what a production designer does. And I, I love movies so much. And then I realized, what am I like? That I could, you know, I, it would. This book would be better if it was aimed at kids. There are some books about filmmaking that are for kids, but there's none that's like, "Hey, girls have done. Girls can do this. Girls have done this." And you know, me, women's history is really yeah. my my great love in life. And then it was actually my old agent, um, uh, Brady McReynolds, uh, who was like, "Why don't you do like a, you know, choose your own adventure style thing?" And I was like, "Wow, that's." wild idea and actually it used to have like a fictional component to it and then we had this book just went through like so many different changes to make it work and landed on what it is now that it's just like totally non-fiction and i actually think it might be the world's first pick your own path non-fiction book yeah. that's what I, when i tell people like it's like a choose your own adventure style non-fiction and they're like what but it totally works in the in the framework of making a movie so because you get to there i mean there are parts of the book where you know because all your choices matter and there is a this one part where you a disaster might happen you might have to turn back and like start at the beginning and try making the movie again and you meet totally different people going through all the different paths and yeah, it just it was really wild to kind of put together because I've never had to think about different paths through a nonfiction mm -hmm. story before, but it was really fun. And I hope people get a lot out of it. I'm so excited. For, like I said, I I definitely have pre-ordered for all of my nieces and also one for myself just because I can't not. So it will be for everybody. The link will be in the show notes and, and you can definitely go get it. I'm so, so freaking excited for this. And like I said, we couldn't not talk about that before. We do the thing that we do. So Girls Make Movies, go get your pre-orders right now. And now as a thank you, we're going to give you a whole bunch of book recommendations. Hell yeah, we are. I'm the home team here, so you can go first. I will I will give you uh, the, the first opening salvo. So it wouldn't be me if I wasn't recommending a spooky book. And I'm very excited. So this book actually comes out in September um, it is called The September House by Carissa Orlando, and it is such an interesting take on a haunted house book. Like, you, I'm obsessed with haunted house books, and this, like, it's really hard to make me, to, to, like, surprise me or show me something that unique. And honestly, that's not a bad thing. Like, I will take the same grieving couple moves into a new house story <laughs> for, for the end of time. But it's very, I, I always get really excited when I see something new and it's about this woman and she is very mild mannered and very, you know, doesn't like to make a fuss at all. And she lives in a haunted house. And at first it's kind of like a very dry and sly, funny book because like all this like crazy shit is happening around her and she's just like making her tea and like, uh, she like see one of the ghosts like has her head split in half by an axe and she's just like oh god the gorp is putting me off of my jam and scones like it's so it's so like dry and then you the book morphs into like this really chilling and macabre story about abuse and resilience and you kind of the, the, the my short pitch about it is it's a woman who's in an abusive relationship with a haunted house mm -hmm. and it's just so smart and so fun and i I, I loved it so much. That's the September House by Carissa Orlando. Okay, we're gonna get off. Tra I, immediately, I want to get off track because I also I didn't have this as one of my rec as one of my picks, but I have a kind of similar one that comes out in July. It's called uh, Magdalena by Candy Sari S A R Y. How do I not? Oh my god! How have I not heard? This is the problem okay. with Adam and I talk to each other is that it involves me ordering books i'm writing this down this is literally honestly like there's few things in life that make me prouder than when i recommend there's two things i have a brother-in-law who knows everything about music so when i recommend an album he has never heard of and then when i recommend a scary book that uh that mallory has not yet heard of so Mac i'm so excited yeah so it is it's a really short book it's like 200 pages they sent me a copy it's delightful it's this like small secluded town and uh oh i'm already one, so in <laughs> it's one of these so it's one of these towns they describe it in the um description i just pulled it up as it thrives on gossip and superstition so it's like one of these small oh, small towns yeah. everyone's in each other's business and daddy is our main character and she offers like basically she's the main interest in all the scandal because there's a there's a missing girl there is a ghost in this and then there's an affair that kind of like 
started everything. So Dottie is very, very reclusive. She's had a number of miscarriages and just kind of like doesn't want to be a part of the very in each other's business town anymore. And she develops this really like weird connection with this 15 year old neighbor of hers named Magdalena. And then there's this like, it, you can never really tell what's real and what's what's not in this, but they sort of, in they have this weird relationship that's very spooky. And there's also like, there's just strangers that come, there's so many things that get thrown into this story. There is literally like crows, which I feel like crows is happening. I feel like crows are having a moment lately, but there's crows. Crows oh, are having a moment. I think, I wonder if crows are going to take the baton from mushrooms. I. I ooh, I bet they will. In fact, I just realized one of the books I'm going to recommend later has a crow on the cover. But like, it's it's very very creepy and unnerving, and the relationship is very weird. And what ends up happening is Dottie like decides to write about her life, and she's like, you know what? Screw all of you guys. I'm just going to write what's actually happened for me. And it's just like it becomes very very creepy. It's uncomfortable in like the best way, but it's at the end. It's like one of these it's sort of like you were talking about it. I thought about it because it's. I have been drawn lately because of life experiences to like ghost stories that deal with trauma. And this is definitely a ghost story that and it's horrible. horror has got you covered. Horror is always waiting for you. Yeah. So that's Magdalena by Candy Siri. That one comes out in July. Um, OK, you do your next one. I know you have an extra one anyway, so we'll just. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now you're going to get seven from, my, from each of us. Uh, so I'm going to take a hard left turn. And I talk about this on on my show this month on a future episode. I have for some weird reason, maybe it's because as we were talking about before the show, 2023 has just been a rough year. Um, I have gotten into romance so hard. And I, I've always liked romance, but it's never really been something that I read. Like I would read like one or two romance books a year. And for some reason, the past few months, like, that's all I want is just romance books. And this book I just finished recently, it's a backlist book. It's called Satisfaction Guaranteed by Karelia Stetz Waters. And it is about this woman who is very, she's an accountant. She's very buttoned up. She, like, runs her parents' very famous art gallery. And uh, her aunt dies. And her aunt was, like, very quirky and very, like, she was a nudist and she loved to do drugs. And she was just, like, this really eccentric old woman. And she owned a sex toy shop and the main character like gets to the funeral and is like, oh, my God, I, you know, my aunt was so weird. All these people are so, everyone is like dressed in gold and people are doing drugs at this funeral. She's just like, I can't deal with this. And she finds out that the aunt has willed her the sex toy shop, but she has to share it with the woman who who runs it and who was like, you know, this, her aunt's like the daughter that she never had. And she is way more like her aunt. She is like, she's wearing a feather boa. Like she is ridiculous. And the two of them have to like get together and figure out how to, how to save the sex toy shop. And it is just so fun. It takes place in Portland and it's just like a total blast. And that's like all my brain has been craving right now is, I mean, my brain's always craving horror, but besides that is like, oh, just give me like fun romances where I, I know that everything is going to be okay at the end. And this one is a blast. Uh, so it's Satisfaction Guaranteed by Corellia Stetswaters. That's awesome. I am also going to cheat and pick one that's coming up later in the month uh, on my show, the one that you're currently listening to, everybody. This author will be on J. Ryan Stradall or Stradall. Uh, oh. I, yeah. So his, I know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> his newest book is Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club. Have you read this? No, but it is on my TBR because I... Um, Someone put him on my radar because he wrote a book about brewers. And I was like, oh, I'll just check out the new one. And it's about a diner, right? It is. So Jay is as Midwestern as they come. And as a Clevelander, I've... <laughs> but there's... So I was actually thinking about you when I, when I, was, I, was, when I was prepping this because we were going to talk to each other. But I know, like, anyone who follows Valerie, I love how, like... Four or five times a year, you'll put like an Instagram story or something up about how you miss New England, whether it's like a specific type of coffee or like, you know, whatever it is. Oh, yes. And so this book, Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club, is extremely my version of that for the Midwest. So it, it takes place in Wisconsin, which is like the opposite end of the spectrum of Midwest from Ohio. But I won't let that, you know, that's OK. That's fine. It's still Midwestern. <laughs> um, but it. I am find my, finding myself drawn lately to stories that are very, like, cozy. And this is an absolute cozy story. It is the story of a supper club, which we get into it in the episode. But basically, for people who are unfamiliar, like, think, like, 
small diner in a community where everyone knows each other, but also like there's specific oddities about supper clubs where like old fashions, which are traditionally a bourbon drink, are made with brandy. And mm -hmm. they're just so sweet, like so sugary and sweet. And they'll give you like a oh, relish sugary. tray with like olives and pickles when you first sit down. And the whole concept is like giving people value before they even give you any money. And so this is the story of a supper club in upper Wisconsin. And it goes through four generations of, of the family who owns this supper club. So it takes place over a hundred years and it kind of jumps back and forth a little bit for the first like two thirds of the story. And it it's just really interesting because it's birthed in a lot of it's a fictional story that's birthed from a lot of Jay's research into these small town places that are like established and are thought of like iconic. But in reality, they don't make much money because yeah, cheaper options all around them. And it's, you know, you go there and people want to they want to get like the meatloaf or they want to get the like prime rib meal that they've been having for generations and they don't want to pay more than $16 for it. So it's really hard to yeah. make money, but then you also get it passed down from generation to generation. So Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club is kind of like this story of these four women who sort of have this either fall to their lap or thrust upon them, depending on their attitude about yeah. <laughs> and the life that they kind of make around it. It's really interesting. Like I said, a lot of it at the beginning is kind of jumping back and forth. They are getting to know everybody. But then at the end, it's it's much more straightforward from the timeline standpoint. It's a little heartbreaking, a little heartwarming, but it is very, very cozy. And it if you are Midwestern at all or know anyone who is, this is a great one. So that's Saturday night. At the Love it. Club. Yeah, really delightful. Uh, so my next one is a really good read alike for people who are looking for more books like The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which is like one of the books that people are always looking for read alikes for. <laughs> it's so fun. It just came out. It's called Advika and the Hollywood Wives by Karthana Ramasetti. And it's about this woman and she's in her early 20s and she lives in L.A. and she's trying to make it as a screenwriter and things are going rough for her. And uh, she works as a, at a catering business like many screenwriters do. And um, she just like... She, her her sister who is a twin her twin had died like the year before and her parents moved back to india so she feels just like very alone and bereft and like uninspired with her writing and just like in a bad place and that night the night that the book starts she's catering she's working as a bartender at one of the oscar parties and she's like working the bar and dealing with all these like extremely annoying Hollywood people who are rude as fuck to her until this one guy comes up and orders a drink. And he is, she can tell that he's older. He's in his sixties, but he's really still handsome. He's like George Clooney-esque mm -hmm. and he's really nice to her. At first she's just like, oh, like what a welcome reprieve from the shitty night. This like older man who is, it? she She doesn't know who he is, but she knows that he has to be, besides the fact that he's holding a fucking Oscar that he just won. <laughs> she know like people treat him with the deference that, only comes from people who are like really famous so she's like she knows he might has to be some, some someone fancy and he ends up like flirting with her and saving her from this really rude woman and like long story short by the end of the night they're making out in his bentley like and she doesn't expect anything to come of it but of course the next day he texts her and things move really fast and before she know it this is not a spoiler, like they're married. Mm -hmm. And all of her friends are like, hey, this seems kind of weird. Like he's 40 years older than you and has a lot more money. And you guys have been only together for like a month and you're getting married. Like, and she's like, it doesn't want to hear it. So she blocks all of them. She likes, she's like, I'm going to start this new life and it's going to be amazing. Um, but pretty quickly into their marriage, this is, he's her fourth wife, by the way, or she's his fourth wife. She gets a, a some communication uh, and actually also sees it in, in the news that his first ever wife died and left her a million dollars and a single film reel that no one knows what it is, but she can only get both these things if she divorces him. Mm. So obviously secrets you're trying to figure out what's going on with this guy with like it is it's such it's like a it's almost thrillery it's really intense it's really fun like the dark side of hollywood kind of stuff and it's it's just a blast uh, it's sort of like a really compulsively re to, to steal a very popular blurb it's a compulsively readable book <laughs> that oh like very intense that is every blurb that i love it yeah oh that sounds good sorry what's the name of that one one more time 
Oh, it's uh, Advitka and the Hollywood Wives by Kurthana Ramasetti, and it just came out, and it's got a really cool cover. That sounds so good. I, I'm that's I'm pre-ordering. I'm it's, ordering that. it's very good. It is. It is so intense. <laughs> Um, it's the, one of those books the whole time you're like, girl, no, what are you doing? <laughs> Why are they? No, 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 no. You're making uh, terrible decisions. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something I don't normally do. I usually pride myself on picking book recommendations that are less popular and less super buzzy. But, but sometimes I, you get it. Uh, my next one's also really buzzy. Yeah. Okay. So mine's Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano or Napolitano. Oh, I haven't heard of this one. Oh, okay. So Anne is the author of Dear Edward, which came out a few years ago. Oh. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So Dear Edward was the story of a sole survivor of a plane crash as a young boy and like basically how a community raises him. Heartbreaking. I oh. And you want to, yeah. So I, I'm just starting to think that Anne, either something horrible happened in Anne's life or Anne or she's just a sadist. Yeah, she's just a sadist. <laughs> or like she has a th- an incredible therapist who walks her through life, and so she's able to write the saddest things. Anyway, hello, beautiful. I am only I'm like three fourths of the way through it right now. And actually, speaking of book podcasters, my buddy Tina, who's also been on the show from TBR, etc. She's the one who like she's become like the the street team for, for this book. Yes, like she posts. She did a post about it, and like now everyone keeps tagging her in these. I know she listens to so high Tina, but um she was the one who told me she's like you need to read this so it's the story it happens to us though is sometimes you just all of a sudden become the street team for a fucking book and you don't know how it happened but you love it and you want everyone to read it yeah so so hello beautiful is the story of it's it's it is it's and it's described in the um like the description talks about how it's basically like an homage to little women and i definitely see that it's the story of four sisters the Padamano sisters or Padamano sisters, however they want to pronounce it. There's four of them and they all are very different in the types of people that they are. One of them is very much like the organizer of the family. Then there's twins and one of them is like a free spirit who's an artist and the other one is looking for their true love. And then there's the fourth one who's a little bit withdrawn from from the rest of the family. But how the story works is it opens with this boy named William Waters who grew up in this house that and this is in my first like three pages so this is not a spoiler he was the second born in a family when he was born his older sibling was three years old and within the week that he was born his sibling tragically dies and so oh, what God. happens yeah so what happened and this is like this Christ I I, cl- I literally am considering this book like a version of like the movie Blue Valentine where it's like starts depressing and that's the high point like <laughs> like it <laughs> It literally, so basically he's, he grows up and his parents like don't even really make eye contact with him, let alone like connect with him. Because he's just a walking dis- reminder of just what exactly. they lost. So he, Jesus. despite all of that, he like does really well in school. He gets incredible basketball and he goes to Northwestern on a basketball scholarship. And he studies really hard in history. He's, but he's very quiet and just like an, an odd person, which who wouldn't be with his upbringing. Ends up meeting Julia, who is the oldest of the sisters. They fall in love, get married, have a kid. Um, but like all throughout it, what happens is you get a huge chunk of his story. And then you get little chunks in each chapter of each either sibling's story or his story. And it's it kind of like overlaps each other. So one of the chapters will be like January 1983 to April 1983. And then something like horrible will happen at the end of that chapter and then it'll go back to like February 1983 but it'll be someone else's perspective and then you see it from their perspective and then you get your heart stabbed again and then you go back to some oh. perspective but it's like it's really interesting to see how like Anne did an incredible job of creating these extremely unique characters who are sisters and like how they come together in a way like I'm the youngest of four and my siblings and I are really close and it's interesting to see these characters like this. So it's it's basically the story of the four siblings and their relationship with each other and how, despite all these things that are happening around them, how they find a way to stay together. But just like, if you're going to read this, anyone out there, just buckle up because you don't get a t- box of tissues. <laughs> yeah, just get a box of tissues. Brace yourself. Have an, a good, ugly cry. Yeah, that's Hello Beautiful by Anne Napolitano. 
So I'm also going to jump on the, the hyping up already hyped book train. But this book is just so good that I have to. It is a wild read. It is Yellow Face by R.F. Kuang. Oh, this book comes out this month, I think, in May. And holy shit, Adam, this book is a wild ride. It is the only book I have ever read where it is from the point of view of the antagonist. And you are the whole the whole thing. And you are rooting for something terrible that happened to this person. <laughs> literally every chapter. Uh, it is about this woman and she is white and she uh, she's a writer. She's always wanted to be a writer. And she has this friend who they went to the same college. They were in this, almost all the same programs up until like they were about to leave college. And then their paths started to diverge. The main character, you know, she did okay. She got into an okay grad school. She Her first book was with a smaller publisher and didn't do very well. And now she's teaching at a college. And she's just like, she's having a hard time coming up with a new book to write. She's just kind of like on the skids. But her friend, right out of college, got a six-figure book deal. Every single book that she's ever written is at the New York Times bestseller list. She gets paid. She's a millionaire and she gets paid to speak all over the place. She's just like uh, the golden child and she is uh, from a Chinese American family. And so the one night they are, and they still are like c kind of like frenemies. The thing about the really successful writers that she doesn't have a lot of friends. And for, and for some reason that the main character can't figure out, like she keeps like wanting to hang out with her and go out for drinks because they still they both live in dc still so she's like doesn't even really like her that much but oh because her this friend is so famous like always says yes always goes out for drinks with her so one night they are celebrating the very successful friends more yeah uh you know one of her new deals it's her uh, her latest book got option for netflix and she's all excited about it she so the main character is like going out to celebrate with her but she's just like oh you know her friend is like she's so beautiful and so successful and everyone's hitting her on her at the bar and she just feels like chopped liver and this is not a spoiler because this happens right away uh i i won't tell you how it happens but through weird events that happened that night the successful friend dies um and something that is that like one of like the hallmarks of her writing is that she doesn't work on computers like she types all of her manuscripts on a typewriter and so when she until like something is ready to be published there is no digital version of it it only exists in her office so the main character while she's waiting for the the ambulance to show up and like the the cops and stuff she sees looks in her, this this her friend's office and sees the fresh stack of typed pages of this new manuscript that no one is sorry about no one knows what it's about it doesn't exist anywhere but in this apartment and so in like a one moment of well i guess not one moment but like a moment of of ridiculousness grabs it and she ends up bringing it home and editing it and starts to pitch it as her own and it is about it's about china it's a world war ii novel about chinese laborers so her the main character's name is june song hayward mm -hmm. or june or yeah june june juniper song hayward but she for up until this point she's always gone under june hayward but now she now she, that she's pitching this book she goes under Juniper song and she takes an ethically ambiguous author photo and like the book becomes viral and does really, really well. And it, it's harder and harder for her to keep up this illusion. And it is just like the most all out like you can. It, I, the best blurb I saw for it is that you have to kind of read it through your fingers because <laughs> it's like it's just so wild. It's so bonkers. Again, you are waiting for something horrible to happen to this woman the entire time. And it's like really salty about the publishing industry. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a wild book, but it's so good. Man, I'm trying to think if anyone's had like a better publishing like three or four years than R.F. Kuang. Like you've got I know, good for her. Happy War books. You've got um Babel. Babel. Babel, yeah. And, and this book is so different from Babel. It's so cool. There's something I think they like they have like two PhDs or something. Like it's so it's, Yeah, they're, they're a complete genius. Yeah. It's one of those like frustrating. This book is it's a salty publishing book and it is 
it, on paper, like you look at it, you're like, well, why would I want to read about this person? But like, it is so compelling. And it is like, you cannot fucking put this book yeah. down. I literally I had I have the NetGalley app on my phone. And I would have to be careful because sometimes I read between sets when I'm working out. And like, I had to not read this book because I'd be sitting there for like 10 minutes. And like, I'm like, that's too long. Because <laughs> you can't put it down. It's just so wild. Unrelated. That's the most Mallory sentence I've ever heard. <laughs> Incredible. I read I in between. In between sets. <laughs> oh my god. I I so I have not met RF. I haven't interviewed them ever, but that feels like an interview like Oh, it'd be so cool. Yeah. Like the week that this comes out, my my episode is with um Rebecca Mackay. And they Oh my were, god. Yeah. And what a get. She was one of those people where like as I was having a conversation with her, I was like, You are smarter than me. Like <laughs> you even know, like you meet those people where you're just like, Oh my god, you think of the yep. you know, like that'd be the same way. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. I so here is my mandatory spooky book when we have a conversation. Yes. I'm. I feel like you might have read this one though. It came out in 2022. The Book Eaters by Sunny Dean. We did. Yeah, Bri and I read that because it it was funny because every once in a while we do a book or we hear about a book on reading glasses, not be, not necessarily through publishing, but just because so many of our listeners are reading it, and that's what The Book Eaters was. We were like, we gotta read this because everybody loves this that it listens to this show. It is such a wild concept. It's so wild, and also now that you said that, as soon as you said that, I was like, oh yeah, that's obviously where I got the idea to read the book was from you guys. I'm a <laughs> dummy. Anyway, The Book Eaters. You should tell me all about it because it is such a cool idea. It's such a cool concept. So, okay, there is this family, and they're literally known as the family. And they are literally like what's known as they're a clan of book eaters. And what a book eater is, is they are literally people who, like, for sustenance, they eat books. And they have this trait where Anytime they eat a book, they kind of gain that knowledge, but they aren't able to write or like communicate via language. Like they can't send each other text messages. They can't write letters. They can't write their own books. But like if they are in London and they want to know the way around London, they can like eat in underground like rail. Oh, it's so crazy. It's so weird. And so, but in addition to these book eaters, there are sometimes people that are born in like their lines that are mind eaters where they're like for lack of a better term think of them it's almost like they're like vampires but they eat people's brains instead of drink their blood like there's that's a perfect way to put it yeah yeah <laughs> like that and it, none of this is a spoiler like you learn all of this yeah in the first 10 15 pages but and so to them it's like like they like i said they get all these different types of books but not it, so you have all that that's like just establishing who the characters are and then the actual story is like the complex complicated relationships that these families have with each other because they're constantly trying to have more women born basically to like keep the line of book eaters going because they continue to birth the like these men who become these like mind eaters and they kind of turn them into like knights so they can it's almost like they're like the heavies if this was a mob and we have this main character, Devin, who has a child and this child is a mind eater. And like, it's so what? stressful. <laughs> so stressful. And so when a mind eater gets born, they basically either like cast it aside or like basically like it's of no value. And each mother that is basically married off has a relationship for three years while they have a child. And then they like, I believe they have three different weddings they can be a part of. And she has this son as part of her second wedding. Like she had a daughter at first and like the way that they kind of keep dangling the carrot for her to continue to like kind of quote unquote play her part. It's like, oh, you're going to get to see your daughter after this is all done. And she sort of realizes like this isn't going to happen. And so she like escapes more or less with her son. And then it's kind of like she has to figure out a way to help him survive. And like there's this like plot for her to like give back at the other people in the family and there's so much going on. And I didn't even mention the fact that, like, in addition to basically eating books, they're, like, more or less superhumans. Like, they all have, like, superpowers. They can, like, literally, like, Superman, like, leap a tall building and, like, a... it's just it's wild. 
so wild. I don't even know if I did a. I don't even know if I really described think, the plot. No, that I think you did a great job. Ugh. But yeah, the Book Eaters by Sunya Dean. So good, so weird, so spooky. I loved it so much. So I'm gonna do. So one thing last last year at the end of every year, my, me and Bria at Reading Glasses try to do our best books of the year. And every year, I'm like, man, this is mostly horror. So I've been trying so hard to read other genres this year. And so I've been trying to read a lot more fantasy. And the next book, it's so much fun. It's called The Magician's Daughter by H.G. Perry. And it is it takes place in Ireland in like post-Victorian time. So it's like early 1900s, like right after the Victorian era ended. And uh, the main character is this teenage girl. This is it's not a YA book, but the main character is a teenage girl. And she has lived on this sort of magical island as far as she knows her entire life. And he's not her father, but he's her father figure. It's this like magician and his familiar who is a rabbit that can sometimes turn into a man and she's like lived this sort of like idyllic idyllic beautiful existence on this irish island but and now she's getting older as you know the story you know they want to she wants to see the world more she wants to know what's going on and she's noticed that her her magic dad i guess every, like every few nights he she watches him and he he has the stone that can make him turn into a raven and he flies away uh but lately he's been gone longer and longer he is injured when he comes back she wants to know what is going on and he's always told her that she showed up in a boat on the island and when she was a baby and they don't know where she comes from but it turns out that there are people hunting both him and her and that's why they've been hiding on this island for a really long time and uh they can't hide there anymore. They've got to go out in the world and see what is, you know, who's hunting them, what's happening, mm -hmm. uh, who are these people. And obviously things go very wrong as soon as they get off of the island. And there's this whole, like, council of wizards and magicians. And in this world, like, magic is sort of like a natural element. Like, it's like wind or or water, it just sort of is around, but it has been disappearing for the past few generations and nobody knows why. And their story is very tied into what's going on. And it's like sort of like a magical mystery. And it's just like really fun, mm -hmm. nice romp. Uh, everyone loves a romp once in a while. So if you like magic and that like, it takes place in London and Ireland during that time period. If you really like the, like, like those parts of the world in that time period, there's like some nice dresses, fancy clothes uh, and magic. And it's just fun. Just a fun book. Uh, so that's The Magician's Daughter by H.G. Perry. Not only can I co-sign on how good this book is because I've also read it, but... Oh, yay! So I Are you doing a good job? <laughs> it's so great. So um, actually, H.G. is going to be on the show. I, we did an interview. Oh, yay! Let's forget. I will just give everyone a quick preview. Her, I won't like get into it. Her passion is rabbits and mice because she owns a bunch of them. To the point. This is a lot. This is a very rabbit heavy book. I will very say. rabbit heavy book. And the reason is she did her like doctoral thesis on rabbits in literature. What? Oh so, my god! I can't wait for this episode. <laughs> Velveteen Rabbit, Secret of the Nim, like all the like, uh, what are not Secret of the Nim, Watership Down, like we. Mar yeah. So. The depressing episode because we talk a lot about sad murder. Want to come down. Yeah, this will, you know, there's a lot more sad rabbit books than you think there are. <laughs> a lot more sad rabbit books than you think they are. Absolutely right. Yeah. But no, yeah. The Magician's Daughter is so, I love it. It was a great book. So um, fun. Okay. Here's my, as promised, uh, Raven slash Crow covered book, uh, Wayward by Amelia Hart. I was wondering if this was going to be the one. Uh, I haven't yeah. read this and I'm very excited to. Really good. The cover is gorgeous. Um, I believe it was a book of the month pick, um, but it tells it's like three sort of dueling interwoven timelines, which I love a story that is that does it. It reminds me a little bit of trying to think like the best books I can I can think of like it's almost like a Don Kurtagage book, like Teeth in the Mist. I, I, I know you love a spooky YA. I love you a are spooky. my you are my spooky YA expert. Yeah. So I but I this isn't this is not I should clarify for everyone. This is not why I but YA, but yes, Don's book. That same same energy. Yeah, exactly. So the three different timelines take place in like kind of present day ish, two thousand nineteen, in the early sixteen hundreds and then in like the nineteen forties. And so they're all woven together and they take place connected to this wayward cottage, which uh, in 2019, the main character, Kate, is kind of fleeing London and she inherited this this cottage from an aunt that like she didn't even know who it was. And it's it's overgrown and it enables her to get away from an abusive partner. Again, I love a book that's like 
horror that's wrapped with trauma. Um, but she begins <laughs> to be like, she kind of starts to figure out like there's some, you're never going to believe this. There's some sort of secret that her aunt wasn't telling. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you don't say. Yeah, and it's all tied to like the 17th century witch hunts that were taking place. And so in the 17th century, in the 1600s, there's Alpha who is awaiting this trial for murder, for, you know, maybe being a witch, maybe not, and casting spells. But the spells are like of the natural variety. So think the spells of like, what can I like? Like an Alice Hoffman practical magic type spells. And yes, I did just look at my bookshelf to find it. <laughs> um, so there's that storyline. And then there's the mid 1940s where World War II is taking place. And there's this woman, Violet, who is trapped in this estate. And she like wants the education that her brothers are getting. And she is just furious about it. And she discovers these secrets and scratch it like she discovers this locket with this like scratch word that says wayward in it and then it's like weaving these all things that's together. never good yeah, exactly so everything <laughs> is like woven together and it goes back and forth but it all is centered around this very mysterious and witchy cottage that is the wayward cottage and it's very good i love it so much it is it's a little bit creepy it's very dark but there's some good magical realism in there so that's wayward by amelia hart I'm bumping that up on the TBR as well, because that sounds amazing. Uh, my next one is another 2023 release that just came out. It's an author that uh, I really love. It's Venko by Cherie Demaline, and this is an adult literary fantasy, like almost horror, but sort of fantasy. It is about, it's a, it's a witch book. It's Everyone loves a witch book, which is or have been having a moment for quite a while. And it's just a really fun, if you like a book about witches that's much more literary and less like world buildy and much more just like, we're not, we don't care how this stuff works. Like, this is all about the characters. This is the perfect book for you. It's about this woman. She lives in Toronto and she is not doing great in life. She's a temp and she takes care of her hilarious grandmother who is starting, her mind is starting to go mm -hmm. and they're very poor and they're about to get evicted and she doesn't know what she's doing what she's like what she's going to do in life until one day uh she finds this weird little spoon with a witch on it and very soon they get contacted by this group of women who operate out of salem massachusetts called venco and they're very mysterious they're they contact her and they're like hey we want to hire you to to be a writer and she that's that's the main thing about the main character is that she's she's a writer and she's always wanted to be a writer but like life has beaten down those dreams with like the the big hammer of temp work has just like beaten beaten her soul down and she's like i don't know how these people are who i am and i don't know why they want to hire me to be a writer but this seems too too cool to pass up so she goes on this crazy road trip with her grandmother who again is just like so funny and so ridiculous they get there and finds out that she's from a line of witches and she is the latest witch that they want to collect for their coven and all of the witches find these spoons and that's how you know that you're part of this but of course someone is hunting the witches and the witches uh, are trying i won't say what but they're all all working on trying to get together and find the last witch for their coven before something happens and it takes place in salem and in new orleans and it's just like the characters are really fun uh there's great representation uh the, the witch a group of witches is very very crew and it's just really fun i love the way sheree damaline writes and uh it's just a fucking blast it's just like a really fun fun book uh so that's venko by sheree damaline i like the cover too i was just looking up while you were talking it's a cool it's cover. fun yeah. it's cool i have one more my last one i went nonfiction. it came out a couple years ago it's in the weeds by tom batali and it's basically it's the behind the scenes story of anthony bourdain Ooh, yeah and so like to me i i feel like anthony bourdain is one of those people like a as a person who loves i love food and like discovering food from around the world and obviously like cocktails and stuff which i know is you know it holds a special place in your heart as well i, I yeah just, like, buddy i feel like anthony bourdain is like there's a couple people who have passed away now like a few years ago at this point that's still like every time i see a video of them i'm like it just hits me in the heart like him and Robin Williams and there's just like a few people and so I, I was thinking about this book because a, 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 on my TikTok 
mindless scrolling. There was like, there's this, there's this video that I've now seen a bunch of times of Anthony Bourdain making a Negroni where he's not measuring at all. And I just, so anytime I make myself a Negroni, I just call it a, a Bourdain now. Cause I just, <laughs> I just all three of the, it's like, <laughs> Look at the equal parts, so it doesn't matter if it's, you know, two ounces or six. Who cares? You know? Five is only Negroni. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. So anyway, In the Weeds is, it is a nonfiction book, and it's written by his longtime director and producer. And, like, the whole concept of it is, is, like, when people look at all of the different shows that Anthony Bourdain did, they probably were like, oh, No Reservations is, like, anyone who's working on that crew, it must be just, like, a... Like, it's basically like a free tour of the world. This must be incredible. But in reality, like, uh-uh. you know, <laughs> there's so much chaos that's going on. And, like, the book just gets into all these, like, random things. Like, when they're eating a meal in, like, Vietnam or, you know, like, the Republic of Congo or Libya, like, these places, like, they have to go through a whole bunch of stuff to get there. And, like, he just tells these, like, behind-the-scenes stories. And especially the fact that, like, everyone before Anthony Bourdain tragically passed away everyone saw him as like this snarky TV personality. And we've since learned there's a whole bunch more to him, obviously. And everyone contains layers, but like the thing about um, Tom, the writer of this, like he knew all of the idiosyncrasies and like behind, literally behind the scenes aspects that made Anthony Bourdain fully a a full person. And so he just tells you this really interesting, funny, heartbreaking, tragic, like, incredible stories that you wouldn't know and it's super it's super quick it's under 300 pages but it's like you just want to sounds awesome no you just want to soak up as much of it as you can see us that's in the weeds by tom battalion it's the kind of behind the scenes with anthony bourdain oh that sounds amazing i'm gonna take another hard left turn for our last one um i'm gonna go uh middle grade graphic novel it's just so different from what we're talking about but i've been (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> about as far away from an anthony bourdain nonfiction memoir as you oh, can possibly man. get but this is oh it's so much fun it's called whiz kit by tanya j scott and it is this again little middle grade graphic novel it is about this little cat it's a cat cyclops and she is a she's a wizard's apprentice and she's kind of lazy and she against the rules like the opening scene is like she's supposed to be uh, cleaning the house, but instead she's enchanted all of the cleaning products to like work by themselves while she sits on the couch and eats bread. So she does and like she doesn't like going outside. She just wants to hang out and eat snacks. But the wizard she works for is like, hey, you know, if you want to be a full wizard, you need more experiences. You need to go outside. And turns out that one of his library books, uh, who is a sentient talking book, uh, is overdue at the library. And he's like, great. Well, why don't you why don't you be the one to bring this li- book back to the library? And the library book is like oh, extremely eager and earnest and like over enthusiastic about everything. And the main character, Wizkid, is kind of like, oh, geez, OK, I got to take this book to the library. And of course, they end up on like this ridiculous adventure to the library and they meet all these creatures and learn all these little lessons. But it's just like so cute and heartwarming and fun and bookish at the same time. And I was just like, oh, this is I, I read it yesterday, which is uh, on Sunday. And it was like perfect Sunday afternoon waiting for my hockey game to start like, oh, Beautiful. Just it's so much fun. So that's WizKit by Tanya J. Scott, who does she wrote it and drew it. The shit eating grin I just had on my face while you described that book. Oh my god, I'm shit. It's so cute. Ah, oh, that's incredible. All right. Well, listen, everybody, I feel like the people who listen to this, it's like I'm a circle inside of the Venn diagram of reading glasses people, <laughs> much like it used to be <laughs> at professional book nerds. But in case you don't Go listen to Mallory and Bria. On <laughs> they now have over 300 episodes of... Oh, my God. I can't believe it. <laughs> bookish discussions and recommendations and all of the incredible aspects that make being in the reading community so wonderful. And most importantly, go get Girls Make Movies. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Please do. If you want to get a, a signed copy of it, the only way to do it is to order from Skylight Books, which is the indie bookstore that I love to partner with. And they're just wonderful. So if you just go on skylightbooks.com and look girl, look up Girls Make Movies, that's where you can get a signed copy. You are the best. As always, this is my, like I, I say a lot of times, like I love doing podcasts, but in reality, I love doing this specific podcast. <laughs> yeah. so that's I, I will come back literally anytime. Every, every like, 
you and I are basically just a stack of book recommendations and trench coats. So, <laughs> oh, absolutely, you're the best, Mallory. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell. Hi, my name is Sara, and I want to tell you about my podcast called Can I Offer You Some Feedback? I'm a business consultant and executive coach with over 20 years experience in change management, leadership development, and naturally providing feedback to high performers. My podcast is for those of you who have a complicated relationship with feedback, whether giving, receiving, avoiding, or seeking. Feedback is essential for our development. In each episode, you'll hear from real people across industries with their ideas, perspectives, and best practices on feedback. I'll also be sharing business bites with you, simple explanations of organizational tools, management techniques, and leadership philosophies that will help you and your businesses thrive. You can listen to Can I Offer You Some Feedback on your favorite podcast app or learn more at evergreenpodcasts.com.